Why don't you, let me ask you to allow me to put my body and my mind in the same place and open in prayer, okay? Father, we are thankful for your love today. I'm so thankful for the way that you have shared all the things that I need to walk with you. That your word isn't just words on a page. It's the powerful, transforming, life-giving truth of the triumphant, risen Christ. And what I have is from the very creator God who made me. And you are ready to speak into my life and transform my life. Help me to not treat my Bible like it's a math book or a history book. These are the powerful words that you've given me to change me. And with all of that understanding, let me open my heart to you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak into my heart and make changes at the level of my want to. Change my will because you work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are... 1189 chapters in the Bible and I'm that geeky guy who counted. And what I can tell you is that some of it is incredibly easy to figure out what to do. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to read Thou Shalt Not Steal and go, gee, I wonder what I'm not supposed to do from that passage. Some things are pretty easy. Now there are some things that are just plain not. Some of you have not yet had the wonderful, glorious experience of going to the life-changing Swedish store, Ikea. These are the people that show you that if you only had a cardboard box in the backyard that's three feet by six feet, you could live in it, and here's the furniture you could build to put inside. Have you seen these things? You walk in this little thing, you know, and, and everything does like five things. It's like tiny homes, you know, where it's both your toaster, your TV, and your, you know, stereo. It's everything. It's like you touch it and it does everything. Well, here's the thing. The word IKEA is actually a Swedish word for ridiculously difficult to put together puzzle. That's what it means. I bought a little... It's a little sink thing for your, your little tiny bathroom. My wife said, oh, I really like that one. So I bought it, and I brought it home. It was like 4.3 million pieces put together by toothpicks. And I was like, how the heck is any normal individual supposed to build this thing? And it had so many, there was pieces that you had to look at through a microscope to figure out how to fit it to the other pieces and the unbelievably difficult instructions, and that's what Leviticus looks like to some of you. It looks like a section on wah, 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 kill a lamb, wah, 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 make him bleed, wah, wah, wah. You have no idea why in the world would the God of heaven share this with me? And I get it, I, I do. But honestly, let, let me start at the beginning because some of you are coming in and you have been in the church since the cradle roll, they were like teaching you names like Zedekiah before you could even like speak words like water, okay? So you've been at this a long time, but some of you are going, you know what, I just kind of fell into this following Jesus thing and I really don't even know what's in my Bible. Your Bible is divided into two parts. It's not really Old Testament, New Testament. That was a guy who read something from Hebrews that thought he knew where to put that. That's not what it is. It's actually divided by language. So the first two thirds of it are Hebrew or Aramaic. And those are Middle Eastern languages written in a script that doesn't have anything to do with anything you could read if you saw a road sign in downtown Jerusalem. Then the last part, the last third, the part that is written that we often refer to as the New Testament are the Greek sections. So you've got Hebrew and Aramaic, and you've got Greek. But when you take apart the Hebrew and Aramaic section, there's actually three parts to it. About 200 years before Jesus, a group of rabbis or scholars decided to break up the Hebrew scriptures into three different segments. The first part is called the Law, the second called the Prophets, and the third called the Writings. The, the law are the books of Moses. 
Those five books at the very beginning, sometimes referred to as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. If you went to school at the time of Jesus, you would have gone to a local synagogue, and ladies, you would have learned how to read and write at home. Gentlemen, you would have gone to a rabbi at a synagogue. And if you went to the rabbi at the synagogue, you would learn history from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Math, you would learn from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Social science would come from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You get there's a pattern to it, right? So the idea is the five books, the books of Moses, that are written mostly by Moses, but not completely. So, for instance, Joshua probably put the part on where Moses dies. I don't think that Moses was sitting there sobbing as he wrote the story of his own death. And then went out and died accordingly to the script, you know. He says, I'm supposed to die, so let me go die now. I, I don't think it really happened. That. I think that Joshua perhaps Samuel puts the end on Deuteronomy 34. But for much of it, it says, this is the word that God gave to Moses. That's the law. The prophets are divided into two sections, major and minor. It just means big and little. Major doesn't mean he's like in the major leagues and the minor's like, I'm a minor league prophet, but when I get really good at it, they're gonna send me up to the major league. It's not like that. It's just lots of words, less words, okay? And those are divided into four sections. Guys who were, during the time of the two kingdoms, guys who were when the northern kingdom got taken away in captivity, guys when the southern kingdom got taken away in captivity, and everybody when they came back. And those four sections, you know the best way to remember this? It's really simple. When I was a kid, my parents used to send us to bed in the summertime. It seemed like it was like five o'clock at night. Do you remember this? Like, now I, some of you can't even believe that this, I'm before the wheel. We didn't have air conditioning, okay? So we would go to our second floor hot bedroom. It was hot as blazes. And it was like five o'clock at night. I mean, I think they just wanted to get us into bed so they could have a great time. And we're up there, and my brother and I are in this bedroom. Now, two guys in a room, not tired, very hot. This is a prescription for, you know, disaster, right? So what happens? Well, for a while, we're, you know, shooting rubber bands, then we're hitting each other with pillows, then we're jumping on beds, and then somebody's spitting water on somebody, and suddenly you hear my dad come to the bottom of the stairs. And what does he do? All right. Knock it off up there, I'm coming up with the bell, right? So we're all going to be all upset and, you know. And then, of course, two minutes later, <laughs> no, that's, don't stick me. <laughs> and then we're just, it just gets out again. Eventually, Dad comes. And he grabs my older brother and he takes him out. I have uh, an idea in my mind though, of what could be happening. I see him hanging out there, his dad's lashing him, and I don't know whether they're, you know, drawing and quartering him or whatever. I have no idea what's happening, but I know he's not with me. Okay, the first kind of prophets were the prophets that had to do with when there was Israel and Judah, two brothers, and God said, knock it off or I'm coming down there and I'm getting you out of your land. Then the older Israel, the northern kingdom, is taken away. Now I'm up in the bedroom and I'm by myself, and you would think that that would mean I would just, you know, go to sleep. Nay, nay. That is not what's going to happen. So what do I do? I get in trouble. I don't know how I got in trouble. I was just trying to disassemble the end of the bed when the whole thing fell apart and went, <laughs> it made a big noise, and then my dad came up. Now I'm envisioning I'm going to be put on meat hooks and who knows what will happen next. And he takes me out and says, that's it, sit here in the hallway. And I find out that to my surprise, my brother's actually in a chair at the other end of the hallway. Some of the prophets were given while Israel was still around. Some of the prophets were given when Israel and Judah were both being taken away, sitting in captivity, waiting to go home. Some of the prophets were given when God called them back home. The northern kingdom was lost, the southern kingdom came back, and we call those post-exilic prophets. Okay, so you have the law, you have the prophets, and then you have a series of other books, God's view of what's <coughs> happening. So for instance, God's view on how things normally work, that's Proverbs. Proverbs aren't promises, they're just God's view of how things normally work. When I had a dog, 
I would have people come over and dog sit, and I would say, now this is when Chloe normally eats. Of course, that's not gonna happen when I'm away because she's gonna be depressed, so she's not gonna eat, but this is the way it normally works. That's Proverbs. It's how it normally works. So they're not promises, and it might not work in your case, but it was designed that way. How about a book like Ruth? Well, how friendship is designed to work. Or if you really get bored during a talk, Song of Solomon, how sexual love is supposed to work as part of your life, because that's in there too, because God created everything about you. I want you to remember something. God didn't just make you able to ingest food. He gave you taste buds. What does that tell you about God? He wants you to live, but he also wants you to enjoy the experience. Please don't take out of a week here at Momentum we want you to just be tough, love God, and suffer. Go out into the world with Jesus, the gospel, and suffering. And then you die and go to heaven. Because <laughs> that doesn't tell me why God made peanut butter. <laughs> God made peanut butter and coffee and chocolate because he's a good God. And he wants me to have a great time while I'm on the journey. Okay, so we have all the prophets and the rights. All right, let's break it out just a little bit further. Because you came to look at the tough stuff. Part of the law is this legal voice of God. So let's take the books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I'd like to zero in on what the law is. The law is not one thing. It's actually three different things. Guys, if you get this wrong, a lot of the Bible is not going to make any sense. And a lot of it doesn't make sense because we come up with this unbelievable idea about the, the law, like the law is a tutor that got us to Christ, and then we dissed it, and now we can do whatever we want. Or I hear people kind of summarize the law. Law, bad. Grace, good. Law, heavy. Grace, light. The word for that is nonsense. See, the law established the way God thinks. I got an older brother. I told you about him a little bit already, but Russ is a pastor now, but he was a bad kid, okay? I, I don't know how to tell you what happened. He fell on his head as a child. I don't really know, but what I can tell you is this. My parents had a different curfew for my brother than me. I don't know why, because I'm actually the more responsible of the two. I mean, I'm not bitter. I'm just saying I was a better kid than him, and I don't really understand why I got a lesser curfew. But the point is he was older, okay? Now, knowing what my, God, my dad told my brother to do, even though he didn't tell me to do it, helps me understand my dad. That's too hard. Let me try another. My son, I have three children. Uh, my two girls can clean, and I have a son. <laughs> and he believes that if it's under the rug and one cannot see it or experience it, it might as well be considered clean. And all God's people said. <laughs> no, okay. The point is that some of you are like that. You go, it's under the bed. It's not bothering anything. Like, you know, you have last week's salami sandwich. Everything's underneath the bed. Okay, so my, my son, he's like, he's, well, he's a mess. He's a good guy, but he's a mess. So I pulled him aside and I said, son, I don't understand what you're doing here. You need to clean your room. And he said, why? I'm only going to mess it up again. Has anybody ever said that to their parent? I'm only going to mess it up again. Okay, it's like saying, why should I eat? I'm only going to get hungry again. That's dumb, okay? So the point is that because there's peanut butter and everybody knows that's a God thing. Uh, the, the important thing is this. I said to him, son, I'm your dad. I want you to be a stand-up guy. I want you to have a good job, okay? To have a good job, you have to show up, okay? To show up, you gotta drive there, okay? To drive there, you gotta find your keys. I want you to clean your room so you have some order in your life and know how to get to where you're going. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> now, the law wasn't written to you. It was written for you. You do not have to kill a goat to make God happy. So why in the world do you need to know that Israel had to kill a goat to make God happy? I mean, really, it, it, the problem is we have to understand what it's for. 
I need to kill off an idea that floats around our churches and, and things that Christians say, the idea that the law somehow was done away. Jesus said in Matthew 5, I did not come to tear the law out by its roots, Matthew 5, 17. But rather, I came to what? Fulfill. But fulfill does not mean what you think it means. Fulfill does not mean I kept them all and then retired them. Jesus never fulfilled a single marriage law. He never got married. To the best of my knowledge, he never cleaned any mold off his tent. He never kept any of the hygiene laws that are specified in the New Testament. Fulfilled doesn't mean I kept them all, thereby sending them into retirement and replacing them with ping, me, okay? That's not what he means. He says, I came, the word plerao is the word to dominate, to fill up with, but it's also the medical term for, did, did you ever get to a place where you broke a limb? I hate talking about this. Did you ever break a limb and they had to set the limb back so that it could get casted and then healed? I was uh, playing a manly game of kickball with toddlers at the church and broke my leg in three places. It's not, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I, there was, look, I had a reason, okay? I was running for second base and a little boy stepped in the way. He's not a little boy anymore, but he was at the time. He stepped in the way, so I thought, I better miss this little child. So I kind of went out of the baseline and I slid a little bit and my left ankle hit one of those tufts of grass and went snap and was laying this way. And I'm laying on the ground. And these little kids with big eyes are looking around me, Pastor Randy, what happened? <laughs> no one ever died of pain. <laughs> now would be a good time to get Pastor Randy some adult help. <laughs> and I'm laying there very mindful of my testimony. <laughs> it's true, that's exactly how it happened. And then some guy in the church scoops me up with my leg dangling. Going, oh, look, this looks broken. No, oh, you moron. I mean, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so anyway, so he takes me out. All right, now my point is that, what was my point? Why don't we know what I'm talking about anymore? The, the whole idea that the law is done away is a wrong idea. The word play ra'o means I came to set it back into its position to tell you what I meant by what I said. So when Jesus uses the law in Matthew 5, he says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You remember that formula? You've heard it said, you shall not kill, but I say unto you. He's not saying, I canceled that. Now you can kill your roommate. Okay? What he's saying is, I say unto you, you heard me say, don't kill with a knife. And I mean, don't kill with your words, your heart, your intent your attitude. You heard this, I meant this. He's not changing the law, he's saying I put it back where it belongs because you got the list but missed the point. Now, how do we deal with something like the laws of Leviticus? Because after all, we're not just talking about some nice little laws that we can apply to our lives, we're talking about some pretty heavy hitting things. Let me divide the law into the three parts that Jesus learned when he was growing up. First, there's the civil code of law. I want you to imagine that you've got the entire group of Momentum students together, and you've decided now that you are going to go on a camping trip that is 38 years, five months, and 20 days long. How many of you think you'd like to kill yourself rather than lead that group? That was Moses' problem. God put him on a 38-year, five-month, 20-day camping trip with people he barely knew who were angry at him the day they met him. And so God gave what we call the civil code of law. You find it in two books. The books are Exodus and Numbers. That sounds funny, but Exodus gets you from Goshen, Egypt, where God sent Moses and all the people out to Mount Sinai. And Numbers gets them from Mount Sinai to Mount Nebo just before they go into the land. So you got to take Exodus and Numbers and put them together to get the whole journey of the 40 years. Does that make sense? So in that, there is law. Not everything is law. Sometimes it's just like, and Moses was out picking flowers or whatever, and this is that people were watching him. I mean, it's not really there, you know what I'm saying. But some of it's just stories. But the vast majority of what's there is to tell you the setting of where they were and how it was. I do camel trips in the desert. 
In fact, I've been back in the country a week. It was 114 the last place I was. I was on camels this year in 134 degrees. I just want to tell you, oh, but it was dry heat. I prefer my heat cool, thank you. Okay, here's the thing. Nobody's ever comfortable in the Sinai Desert on a camel. They call them the ships in the desert because when you ride them, they go like this, and then they go like this, they go like this, and you go like this, and that's how it is. It's a ship, okay? And the point is, it's hot as blazes all day, freezing cold at night, and you are turning around like a rotisserie chicken in front of a fire because half of you is red, the other half is blue, and that's what it looks like every night in the Sinai. My point is that in the civil code of law, people, when they get together, don't behave. That's why we have to make rules for every organization. So, in Exodus 20, 21, 22, and 23, there are four chapters of how to get along on the camping trip in the desert. How not to kill your roommate after 38 years, five months, and 20 days in the desert with them when it's hot as blazes in the daytime and freezing cold at night. It's not going to be fun. There are going to be a lot of times you're going to get out there and go, we've got no water to drink. And so here are the rules, Exodus 20 to 23. But that's not all of them. Numbers chapters 5, 6, 15, 28, 29, 30. Numbers 5, 6, 15, 28, 29, 30. That's six more chapters of what we would call civil code of law. It's simply this. When you think of Exodus and Numbers, think of it this way. How to get along on the camping trip and be civil. Those rules, by the way, still work. Because did you know civility is still a thing? So here's a civil code law. If you find on your tent mold, what should you do about your mold problem? You should fix your mold problem, because if you don't fix your problem, your mold problem is going to become my problem. Now you go, well, how is that a spiritual principle? Well, duh. Can I just ask you, when you get out of here and you go on and you find somebody you want to love and you have children, would you please raise them? Because if you don't, i got to pay the jail to do it for you. The truth of the matter is those spiritual principles still work. But that's first law. There's another code of law. This is called constitutional law, and it's found in Deuteronomy. Does anybody know what Deuteronomy means? Second law. Who knew? There's a second law, okay? Second law, Deuteronomy, second law means constitute 15 articles of the Constitution of how to live in a godly way as a nation because you're claiming that God is your God. Can I just tell you, every nation in the world shapes its own God. Israel was not to shape a God, they were to hear from one. By the way, in America we do this. Secular America has built a God. Did you ever read in the Old Testament, and, and their God's name was, or they made a God and formed a God? And you thought to yourself, well, how stupid. You just carved this God, now you're bowing down to it? How dumb is that, right? That's exactly what Hollywood does today. We have a God that we've made. I call our God the mush God. The mush God of America always thinks America's right. Always wants to bless America. Forget that we kicked them out of the schools. Forget that we don't even want to talk about them or have any kind of right or wrong moral standard. But even the worst actor in Hollywood, when they die that night on the news, some of you will say, but they're in a better place. Because we serve the mush God of America that always loves us and never asks us to do anything. Because that's the God we formed with our hands and we bow down and worship. Okay? So if the constitutional code in Deuteronomy is how to build a nation that honors God, what's Leviticus for? Because that's the third kind of law. So I've got civil code, how to get along with each other on the camping trip. I've got constitutional law, that's 38 years later, how to build a nation. But then sitting at Sinai, I have this weird book. In Hebrew, it's called Vaikra. Vaikra is the word, and he called. The title of the book is, and he called. How many of you think that's a really lousy title and will not sell anything on Amazon? Okay, see, in, in the past, they didn't have books like this. They had scrolls, right? 
So the first three words on the scroll when you open it up, that's the title. So whatever it starts with, that's how you know. So when you open up the first book of the Bible, it says, in the beginning. Bereshit. Genesis. Okay, in the beginning. And so it was called, in Hebrew, Bereshit, it's called in the beginning. We call it Genesis because it makes more sense and sells better on Amazon. And after all, that's the point of life, isn't it? Um, and, but, but the Leviticus was, and he called, because that's the first three words. Now, when you look into Leviticus, let's take it apart for a minute. What is it? It's the criminal code of law. So you have civil, constitutional, criminal. Guys, I know this might not be scintillating stuff, but I'm telling you, if you get it, it's going to help you a great deal to understand how God thinks. Because it's hard for us to picture it this way. God is not a happy mommy in the sky trying to make you feel better. He's a judicial dad. He thinks in judicial terms. That's not bad. Some of you go, but that sounds so mean. Listen, if you're on the right side of the law, you might think that sounds mean. But wait till you're victim. Wait till you're victimized by someone. Then you want the law to come in, and you want to take a stand and right what was done wrong to you. See, to the criminals, the police are the problem. To the criminals, the judges are bad. But to those of us who are law-abiding citizens, the police and the judges act on our behalf to, to actually stand up for us. You can't do that to me. Someone's going to catch you and throw you in jail, and that's where you belong. So when you look at God as a judge, don't think of it as a bad thing. Think of it as a good thing for the person who's doing what they're supposed to do. The only people that despise God as judge are the ones who want to rebel and want to be okay in rebellion. Some of you are going to go, but I want God to do it my way. Then you be God. The part of God will be by you. But guess what? That's not real. So, the criminal code of law is, your heart's broke. Let me, can I lovingly say this, but say it to you directly? There's something wrong with you. But when I say that, there's something wrong with me too. All of us were born with three problems. More than three, probably, but only three I'm going to tell you about. The first one is that you were born into the middle of a war in a fallen world, in a world that's bent toward rebellion. The second one is, when you were born, the default switch in the software of your heart was set on rebel. I want to do what I want to do. Don't tell me who I am or what I want to do. I will do what I want. This is the reason why the fundamental fight over gender is happening. Because God can't even tell me what he made me. I'm going to throw a switch on how I feel about who I am. I'm an archaeologist, and a thousand years from now when I dig you up, you'll be either male or female, and it doesn't matter what you thought you were that day. That's science. And if that sounds harsh, I can only tell you that reality tends to be very stubborn. Okay? I was looking at my bank book the other day, and I really feel like a millionaire. <laughs> but the bank doesn't agree. And reality is so darn stubborn. Now, here's my point. My point is that in criminal code, I'm born with a default switch set for rebel. I've got a fallen world around me that loves to sing about how good it is to rebel and how happy all things will be. And then I've got a fairly healthy crop of demonic uh, 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 presences around me blowing the fan going, do it wrong, do it wrong. And so I've got, I've got three problems I'm facing right out of the gate. Leviticus is divided into three parts. So let's just quickly chop it up. One to seven is times when God asked them to kill and grill. Okay? It's the barbecue. Times when this is like the worst way to study the Bible ever with me. Okay? <laughs> times to kill and grill. Chapters 8, 9, and 10. Who gets to grill? Because if you've ever been to a barbecue, you know the guy at the grill is pretty... Pretty persnickety about being the guy at the grill. Don't be putting that thing over here. This is my grill. 8, 9, and 10. And then 11 to 27, applications and laws that Levites had to know about. Now, who are Levites? I mean, it sounds like such a 
I mean, you want to put a costume on the guy as soon as you see, hear the word Levite. It sounds like he ought to be like wearing some big robe or something. Levite just means a son of the tribe of Levi. And some of them were in the family of Moses and Aaron. And those are called priests. But not all Levites are priests. All priests come from within the sons of Levi. So you have Levites, or your garden variety Levite, and they're supposed to do spiritual things and help God to push God everywhere. And the priests who are supposed to do specific things related to helping people interface with God in the temple and tabernacle. The first seven chapters, some of you are sitting here, and I can tell by the look of your eyes that you are already sitting here going, yeah, this book doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Let, let me see if I can show it to you. If you went to Leviticus 1, here's what you would see in Leviticus 1. There's an offering called the Ole offering. Say, Ole. Ole. Oh, you got to pick it up at the Ole. Ole. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. So, Ole, Aliyah means to go up. Ole means to go up. It's the idea of, I want you to bring this animal in, and I want you to incinerate the animal on a grill. Now, if you grill like me, this is actually quite easy, okay? Because I can't make a burger that you can eat. But you can play hockey with mine. Anyway, the point is, you bring in the animal, you take the animal's life, you put your hand on the head of the animal, you bring the animal in, you slice the throat of the animal, you drain off his blood, you take it up, you portion it out, you put it on the grill, you sizzle it, it becomes nothing but ash and smoke, and God goes, ooh, I like it. That's chapter one. It is a dedicatory offering, a dedication to God, that when I bring this animal, everything belongs to God and I get nothing to take for me. Nobody eats this. God smells it. That's it. Now, is there any offering anywhere in the New Testament, anywhere from your looking at the scriptures, is there any place in scripture you can hear God tell you that in order to dedicate yourself to him, you have to bring yourself to him, lay yourself before him, and your life belongs to him. It's so that he can go and enjoy your life. Is there anything like that in <clears throat> Romans 12, 1 and 2? <laughs> See, the book of Romans is structured to say to you, you were lost in chapters 1, 2, and 3. But God, who's rich in mercy, sent his son to die in your place to make it possible for you to be justified before him, 4 and 5. And in 6, 7, and 8, he gave you everything necessary to grow you up in him. He gave you his spirit so that you might thrive with him. And in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's taken care of Israel in the past, present, and future. And he said, because all that's true, chapter 12, verse 1, I want you to stop. I want you to take your body, put it in the pen, and get inspected, top to bottom. I want God to look at everything that's in you, and I want you to submit yourself wholly to him, and I want you to stop being pressed into the mold of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can show God things about your life that will make him smile. See, that's Leviticus 1. It's just played out again in Romans 12. And the idea is God has the right to tell you to lay everything down because he gave you everything you have. Now some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but I want some of it for me. The delight is that God lets you live it. But let me just tell you, you are one heartbeat away from not being here. And the heartbeat was sponsored by the God who made you. You're not making you able to stay here. This planet is inhabitable because he makes it be inhabitable. So let's stop and say, well, what about Leviticus chapter 2? Because I'm reading in Leviticus chapter 2, and he's talking about if you want to come and you want to bring some grain to the Lord, and you got this seed, you bring this seed in. And if you, if you have this little stalk of barley, you bring this stalk of barley in. And if it's time for you to chop the head of the barley off, you bring that in. And if it's a time when that's all been done, you can make flour. And if it's a time when you turn it into cakes, you can make cakes. It's called the mincha. The mincha is a slice or an apportionment. And here's what he says. He says, look, every point in your week, every point in your year, every point in your month, I want what you have right now. Don't tell me about tomorrow. Tell me about now. Don't you dare sit there and go, I'll dedicate my heart to Jesus just after high school. You won't. 
I'll do it after college. You won't. See, the problem is you're taking you with you. And the calluses that grow every time Jesus looks for you to yield and you say later, it's another layer of a callus. Another layer of a callus. Another layer of a callus. So here's my point. In Leviticus 2, he says, at every point in the year, you'll be ready to give me what you have right now. If you're not ready to give Jesus what he's asking you for right now, listen to me very carefully because I mean this with all my heart. The thing you won't give him will be the thing your life becomes about. I'll give him everything but that relationship. Then guess what your life's going to be about? That relationship. Everything but that bottle. And it's going to be about that bottle. Because it doesn't matter that Eve was reaching out for some fruit. It could have been touching wet paint. It didn't make any difference what it was. What matters is when I make up my mind that I have to look out for me because he's not looking out for my best interest and i got to do it for myself. That's sin right there. Sin wasn't eating the fruit. It was reaching for it. Sin is of the heart, not of the hands. The hands fall to the heart. Okay, so I've got a, a dedicatory offering. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm still on time. Uh, I, I have a dedicatory offering. I have an offering where I give God each portion of what I have right then. What about the third chapter? There's another one. Did you know that there's a whole offering? It's called Shalmin. Shalmin is like the word Shalom. What, what is Shalom? Peace is, is, is the way we translate it. But what it actually means is when everything is as exactly as it's supposed to be. So let me just do that for you. There was a moment when my kids were growing up, when the kids were all in bed, the dog was asleep, the cat was laying over there not messing with the dog, I was back in my chair, had my coffee, and the remote. That is shalom. It's when all things are as they should be, and it lasts about 32 seconds a day. Okay, the cat jumps, the dog yells, and you know, here's how it goes. Okay. Shomim is like this. If I go into a cafe in Jerusalem and I buy breakfast, at the end of my breakfast, I'll say to him, Tashlomim b'vakasha, I'll say, would you please give me the bill? The word Shomim means to balance the bill. Okay? So let's say in Leviticus 3, God gave me a son. God gave me a daughter. God gave me a new field. God gave me some increase that I wasn't expecting. Whatever it is, I bring a shalmeen. And you know what you do with a shalmeen? You bring the animal, and they kill the animal, and they grill the animal, and everybody parties, including the Levites. Everybody joins you in for the party. You do condo lines. It's a lot of fun. I mean, hey, uh, the whole idea is you bring it to the tabernacle or the temple, and there you say, God, thank you for giving me what you gave me. You gave me stuff I never expected to get. That's a show me, and that's Leviticus 3. Now, what, what does that have to do with you? Can I just ask you to remember something? God loves to party. He just wants to be invited. And if it's a party he can't go to, it's not a party you should be at. But if it's a party he can go to, now it's a party. One other thing, Jesus loves to dance, but only when he leads. He never plays second to you because he's the highest and allowing a second to take place over the first is like ruining math. He doesn't do it. Okay, there's a fourth and a fifth chapter, right? In chapter four, it says that there's one called a chata'ah. Can you say this one? Chata'ah. Don't spit at people. Chata'ah. Chata'ah. Chata'ah is the reason they don't let me do bow and arrow at camp. Because chata'ah means missing the mark. And I wasn't a kid who missed the target. I was a kid who missed the barn the target was hanging on. Okay, so they didn't let me do that. Anyway, the point of chata'ah is... Whether I meant to or not, when I do wrong, I now have missed the mark of what God called me to do. I need to address something. I'm going to say it really quickly, but it's important. In the Bible, there's a difference between malice and guilt. Malice means I meant to do it wrong. Guilt means I did it wrong. Because sometimes young people will come to me and they'll go, but I didn't mean to do it as if that meant they didn't do it. There are very few people 
who hit another person's car with their car that intended to today. But that doesn't mean they don't owe for the fixing of the car. You're guilty if you did it wrong, not just if you meant to do it wrong. A young girl comes into my office and says, I'm pregnant and it was an accident. I said, no honey, it was a bad choice. The number of things that would have to happen for that to become an accident, I was walking down the road. Suddenly my dress got pulled on by a thorn and flew off. I fell into a ditch. My neighbor fell on top of me. I mean, could you know how many things would have to go wrong for this to be an accident? This was a bad choice. Okay, so let's like, because we have these nice words we do, you know. It was an affair, like it was a cotillion or something. Come on. Okay, here's my point. Hata means I'm guilty. Not I meant to be, I am. But then there's another one in Leviticus 5 called Asham. Asham is when I use something that was intended for one holy purpose for any other use. Now, this could be something as simple as the knife that's used to sacrifice the lambs I used to cut a bologna sandwich. It could be that, but it really isn't most of the time. God says, I designed you for what I designed you for. When you don't use your life, body, and things I designed the way I told you to design, to design them to be done, you make a mess out of them. My, my son, when he was younger, thought that every tool could be solved by a hammer. You just beat the thing until it comes apart. That's what you do. Okay, yes, but then it's unusable. It's even unrecognizable by the time you get it apart. My, my point is simply this. Al-Sham is when I say, God says, I made this for a purpose, and that's the only purpose you should use it for. Do you know that the part, second part of Leviticus, the last part from 11 to 27, I told you are ways you apply the beginning. So in the beginning, you have all these ways of killing these animals and grilling them and whatnot, but the second part of Leviticus is when it tells you when to use those. Do you know where the Asham is used? The Asham is a dedication that you bring, and it's never the female animal, it's always the male. If you are here from a farm, you know the difference in price. The male animal, the stud animal that can give you baby animals by impregnating all the female animals costs more than the female animals. And when I violate what God told me to use something for, I pay up an additional price. Now, here's the important thing. Leviticus 5 says you always pay an asham after a chata'ah. That means if I use something that God told me to use for a specific purpose, I owe for the sin, and now I owe a male animal, a big priced item, for something of the future, because my male animals, when I kill them, reduces the future stock of what I'm worth. Do you know what the test case for that is in Leviticus 16 and 19? Leviticus 16 and 19 says that's sexuality. He says, listen, when I sin sexually, I not only went, oops, I give up a piece of my future. And even if I'm a God-loving, spirit-filled believer, I still give up a piece of my future. Because stealing a cookie and using my body sexually, by the way, that works digitally, that works alone, that works in every possible way. I give up a piece of my future. So I owe God not only a guilt offering, but I owe him a sin offering. And I read, Paul said it this way, all the sins that we do, we do outside of our body, but when we sin sexually, we sin against our body. What does that mean? It means it costs more. It means it's not just a, Jesus, I'm sorry, I stole a cookie, oh, and yet I had sex. Amen. Because the second one is actually going to give up a piece of your future. There are tapes you can make in your mind right now that 50 years from now, should the Lord tarry, you will still carry in your mind. They will affect your life. So I'm going to end this with be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. Remember when God made you, he made you with a design. Paul said it this way. This is, you'll remember this, okay? And then I'll let you go. He said, in your house, there are pots you cook in and pots you pee in. Don't mix up your pots. That's the best way to think of holy. 
Holy means distinct. It's for what I made it for. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together. I just thank you for uh, helping us to understand that even in places like Leviticus, what we find are rules and laws, but they help us to understand the way you help us to think biblically and the way we can walk with you. Oh God, I pray that we would not just look at you as a judge that would give me rules, but as an incredibly loving God who has done everything possible to draw me to yourself. In Jesus' name.